Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace be yours from the triune God. Amen. Well, this morning at text study, Phyllis gave us a handout, and I'm hoping to reproduce it with due credit if we don't run into any copyright issues. It gives an entire list on one side of things to fast from, and an entire list on the other side of things to feast on. And tonight I'm going to be looking at fasting from the negatives and feasting on affirmations. But probably and especially fasting from the negatives. Remember you are dust, the liturgy says. The theme of Ash Wednesday, of course, is death. It's not rocket science to comprehend that the gray-black color of dirt and ash is the gray-black color of a corpse. The three-word phrase, dust and ashes, occurs four times in the Old Testament, and sackcloth and ashes occurs eight times. Sackcloth, of course, is the burial garb of a corpse. So today we begin our 40-day journey toward the cross and death with an intentional day of fasting and especially repentance. Marking our foreheads with dust or ash, we acknowledge that we die and return to the earth. We admit our own mortality and we take account that our time on earth is short. At the same time, that ash on our forehead traces the life-giving cross indelibly marked on us at our baptism. While we journey through Lent, we return to God. We realize we've already been reconciled to God through Christ. So we humbly pray for God to make our hearts clean while we rejoice that now is the day of salvation. Returning to our baptismal call, we more intentionally bear fruits of mercy 
and justice in the world, and that is the simple summary of the season. Specific tonight to the, today's gospel, Jesus warns us against practicing a piety motivated by outward comparison or show, perhaps motivated by an inward sense of self-protection. He wants us to know where your treasure is, even when we're misguided. He wants us to know where our true treasure is. The prophet urges us to practice God's chosen fast, which turns out to have nothing to do with abstaining from food and drink. Isaiah rather calls out for us to fast from closing our eyes to the needs and wants of our kin and our neighbors. Although we accompany our Savior on a road that leads to death, there's still much work to be done. Demonized people need to be made free. Anguishing people need to be healed. The hungry need to be fed. Racial, gender, and social barriers need to be shattered. The homeless poor need to be clothed and housed and outcasts welcome. I can't say it better than Isaiah himself. He asks, is, it not this, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose bonds of injustice? Undo thongs of the yoke? To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? To bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them? and not to hide yourself from your own kin. It's our great mission on the way to the cross, on the way to death. It's our called piety, our alms, our prayer, our fast. It is our earthly treasure. On this, we must set our hearts, Jesus says. But what if, what if, we really can't see to help our neighbors because we're too focused in on, tuned, attuned to, our own inner inadequacy or limitation, that sense of loss? What if inner negative self-talk obstructs God's vision of who we are and what we can accomplish in God's name? Wouldn't that be a personal, a worthy thing? Wouldn't that be a worthy thing for us to give up and abandon the personal unworthiness and unlovedness we sometimes feel, to abandon that for the season of Lent. To repeat the words of the prophets, not so many, but slightly altered. Isn't this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice which with, with, with which you bind yourself. To undo thongs of the yoke with which you shackle yourselves. To let you, the oppressed, go free. And to break every self-imposed yoke that holds you back. Remember with me that terrifying moment, probably from your childhood, although it could be from your adult life. When you stood paralyzed on the brink of a diving board your toes over the edge, your hands folded together, crying out to your parents, maybe your children, and the coach, I can't, it's too deep, it's too far down, it's scary. This Lenten season, we can all take on a long extended fast from negative self-talk, from words that we're not capable enough or good enough or worthy enough or accomplished enough or simply not enough. Words that say, if we make the dive, we'll drown and suffer and die. We'll remember you are dust. You are going to die. When Jesus and the three disciples came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the entire ministry of Jesus changed from that moment on for the nine months or so to, till Calvary. Jesus plainly, explicitly, directly taught his disciples 
The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands. They will kill him. And three days after, he'll rise again. It goes on to say they did not understand what he was saying. And they were afraid to ask him. They didn't remain in the dark for long. If you remember, there was this one point where Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, well, let's all go up to Jerusalem with him and die with him. Remember, you're dust. You're going to die. Ah, but what kind of a life will you lead? What will you create? What will you bring along with you as you walk on that pathway toward the cross and toward death? For his last three years, my, I was my father's constant companion. Also his caregiver. I consider it the proudest life achievement so far. We built a fairly luxurious ADA suite onto our modest Gig Harbor home and had him move in. I looked after dad in every personal way and Lynn, act, Lynn worked even harder behind the scenes managing his affairs and the nuts and bolts of medical care. Then in the summer of 2017, he suffered what seemed like a light illness, but it led to a very definite and significant stroke. He passed away a week later in his own bed with family all around and many grandchildren. He was 97. Not long after that, I was hospitalized at St. Anthony's with a number of more or less baffling complications. In the middle of my stay, I declined rapidly. I knew I was failing and there really was nothing to be done. Just at the perfect time, my wife Lynn came for her regular visit and duly alarmed at my ashen condition, she leaned down into my face and commanded, you don't leave me. There's more for us to do. There's more for you to do. It actually was the needed turnaround because it sparked the beginning of a rapid hospital recovery. Since then, I've served five congregations, witnessed the arrival and early development of three grandchildren, purchased a home, welcomed my son and his family to live with us at the height of the pandemic. I've been present to continue duties as husband, father, grandfather, brother, pastor, community servant, friend. If I'd been absent the last six years, how could that loss even be calculated? I've got no way of knowing. Also, I would have never been able to experience the uniquely gifted love, encouragement, and support of this Christian community. Your lives, laughter, your own immeasurable service to your neighborhood and the world. And you would have never been able to invite me into your world or I enjoy it. And what would life in Gig Harbor look like if you were not in it? I don't know. You don't know. You don't know the end of your story. No matter how long or few or how long or few your remaining days. Anyway, today, Ash Wednesday, is about letting the truth come all the way to the surface that recall to yourselves your dust. Remember that you're dirt. Not in terms of negative self-talk, though. You have plenty of that, I'm sure. You don't need a pastor or anyone to remind you of that. No doubt you already have occasions where you come down hard on yourself and Repeat negative self-assessments thousands of times, thousands of different ways. 
You might be tempted to believe that you're really the only one that has dirt mucking up your life. Or perhaps your energy goes into presenting a meticulously dirt-free self-image spick and span so that no one can discover and judge you for any of your true failings or your humanity. Yeah, there's dirt. There's dirt all over your life. You're made from dirt, and from dirt and to dirt you'll return. Dirt comprises our entire world, soot beneath the surface of every neat and tidy human story, dust collecting in, collecting in perfect seeming families, ash polluting the precious air we use to speak negative words. On Ash Wednesday, we call that way of hiding for what it is, a false life lived in the service of a skewed self-image, a heart turned in on itself, as Luther says, as well as on Ash Wednesday, that way of living, that inner script gets buried deep beneath God's own mark of death so that we can actually live. Remember that you're dirt. Hence, you've been baptized with all the conferred rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertained thereunto. Yeah, today the truth comes out, there's dirt and it's everywhere. What's more, God loves dirt. If you remember in Genesis 1, God went out to play in the dirt and the results were a dirty creation. So earthy grime does not disqualify us in the eyes of God who first made us out of dirt, it qualifies us to be recreated. Today we give up collectively fasting or presenting our offerings or praying or doing anything else for the sake of covering over any grime. Instead, we wear the dirt on our foreheads because we can trust what God can do with dust. In so doing, we unburden ourselves from the work of serving that relentless master that is self-image. And we make a journey to freedom. We move not by what will make us look a certain way, but by the callings on our heart, imperfect though they may be, because that's where our treasure truly is. Amen.